Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music yeah. My big foot sighting started in Colorado in 2015. Uh, my name is Patrick McWilliams, and prior to the 2015 event, I did not believe in Bigfoot. I didn't care about it. In 2015, my girlfriend and I decided that we were going to go camping one last hoorah for the year. And it was in September, September 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. We were trying to figure out where to go. First, we thought about Beaver Crossings, which is up near Wyoming. And I said, no, you know, that that may be too cold for us. So let's go somewhere closer. And I said, how about Wellington Lake? Wellington Lake is only about a 30-minute, maybe 40-minute drive from Bailey, Colorado. So she was like, okay, let's go do that. Because we had been there many times before. Beautiful lake, very pristine nestled in the mountains around the area. And when we drive out there, there's this little uh, store there. And the store was transitioning from a general store to the Sasquatch Outpost. There's a guy there by the name of uh, Jim Myers, and he's the owner of the store, him, him and his wife. So I, you know, I walked in and we were getting some supplies, some basic camping supplies. And we ended up going out to the lake on Thursday. The whole week in Denver and in the mountains, we were experiencing this drizzly rain. And it was just kind of a miserable drizzly rain. But by Friday, it was supposed to be clearing up. So we get out to the lake and it's still kind of raining on and off on us. We get signed in. We drive out to our new campsite where we're going to be. We can kind of view the lake. Darla, my girlfriend, stays in the car with our little dog. And the dog that we have is a little Pomeranian by the name of Riley. So Riley and her are sitting inside the car while I'm setting up the tent. And the tent is about five feet in height. It's about six feet in length and about eight feet wide. So we can fit two cots in there and and have space for uh, Riley to be nestled into his own little nest. So I get this thing all set up. And in the meantime, she she brings out her gear and she puts it inside the the tent to kind of get ready to go. And I'm setting up stuff. I'm putting up a hammock or or my cot is I put my hammock just off into the trees real close to me. So that gets all done. And we end up making lunch and then dinner and we're kind of hanging out. But then it starts raining again. And so we're like, okay, let's just go to bed. So Darla goes to sleep fairly quickly. Riley, he's all nestled up and he's he's going to sleep. And I'm laying there and I'm listening to the loons out in the lake and they're they're doing their hunting calls. You know, it's, it's beautiful. It just sounds great. About midnight, there's this crazy scream and it comes from up in the mountains to my right. And it sounds like a wah sound. And I'm like, what the heck is that? And I'm really interested in what that is. I'm still listening and it's still, it's doing these calls, these crazy yells. It just keeps coming. It's like, wah, wah. But it's really high up in the mountains. It's not echoing. It's just up in the mountains. I was like, I don't know what this is. I'm I'm trying to figure out what this is. Well, Riley wakes up and he comes over to where I'm at and he presses his face up against my cheek. And I can tell he's a little flustered about what this is. You know, I'm trying to calm him down. But I'm at the same time, I'm like, Riley, what is this? You know, what do you think that is? And you can feel him getting nervous. He doesn't quite understand, but his cheeks are puffing out. He's, his breathing is kind of changing. And at about this time, the screaming starts to come down out of elevation. And when that happens, the echoing starts going crazy. So we're hearing, wow, 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 And it's just coming, it's getting louder and louder. It's coming down 
closer and closer into the valley where we're at. And I'm like, man, this can't be right. I started thinking, if this is a person, it's pitch black outside. There's no moon out. It's raining profusely. The ground is slick. So if you're running around in the dark and you have no flashlight, no way of seeing anything, and you slip, you're falling. And it could be a few feet to a few hundred feet. If this is a person, it doesn't make sense at all. Whatever this is, is, is making great time. And it, it comes down. This started at midnight. And by the time 1230 hit, it was in the valley. And it was moving our direction. And I was like, oh, come on, come on, come on. Come on. This can't be right. And we're, we're still listening to it. And as it's coming closer, it's still screaming. And it's, wah, wah. And I was like, oh, this is insane. This can't be right. There is something way wrong with this. And as it comes in, you can hear it running. You can hear the, the feet slapping the wet ground as it's coming down the road that's behind our campsite, which is about 50 feet behind our campsite. And about that time, Darla wakes up and she says, Patrick, what is that? I said, I don't know what that is. I have no idea, but I wish you would shut up. And this thing is running. She goes, now, now. I said, Darla, you don't get it. This thing has been screaming since midnight. At one o'clock in the morning, it's passing our campsite and it's screaming. Everybody all the way down, all these sporadic campers that are out there are yelling, shut up, because everybody thinks that this might be a girl. But the way that it was sounding in my head, it was like, the girl was roughly getting taken on by a grizzly bear. It, it, it just didn't make sense. As it ran through the campsite, I knew that there was, there's like fences all the way down. There's barbed wire fences dividing up all the private properties. And this thing was going straight through them. And I was just like, that can't be right. And we just kept listening. And as it kept going down, 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 it eventually turned and then it started to go back up in elevation. And the echoing started going again. and as it cleared up and over, oh, I forgot to actually say it. <laughs> Around one, or, yeah, one o'clock in the morning, I turned on my cell phone, started recording it. I threw the uh, recorder to the back of my tent so I could catch this thing as it ran through. And I caught 45 minutes of audio from that. This thing had climbed up and it was echoing again, and eventually it disappeared. So she looked at me and she goes, well, okay, it's all over with. Now you can go to sleep. And I was like, no, I can't go to sleep now. There, there's no way for me to go to sleep with this. So she turns around, she goes to sleep. Riley, he goes to sleep, and I'm wide awake. I'm thinking whatever this was is going to come back. And I wasn't sure if it ever was going to, and it never did. So I finally fell asleep to the sounds of the loons because the loons kicked back on after this thing was gone. And I, I got to listen to it again. So I was like, all right, fine. So when I got up the next morning... I was like, wow, you know, that, that was a crazy thing last night. I got up, I made breakfast, I let Riley out, and Darla eventually came out, and it was still kind of raining on us. And I said, you know, I want to go into town. I want to talk to Jim. I want his take on this, this audio that I had captured. And she was like, okay. I said, I want to do this before DeAndre shows up. Now, DeAndre is her daughter, and she's going to bring out two dogs also. She has a black lab and a pit bull and the black lab is named Dexter and the pit bull's name is Angie. Before they showed up, I, I shot down to Bailey and walked into the store and I said, Jim, is this a Sasquatch? And I played it for him. And he said, no, this is not a Sasquatch. That's an animal. I said, well, what, what kind of animal is it? And he goes, I have no idea. I just know that's not a Sasquatch. And I said, okay, fine. whatever." So I said, what does one look like? And so he walked me over and he showed me the picture of Patty. I was like, that's what a Sasquatch is? And he's like, yeah, that's what they look like. So I left there, drove all the way back to the campsite. And she said, well, and I said, no, nah, he said it was just an animal. Dude. He doesn't believe it's a Sasquatch. And she was like, see? So she automatically cut me down just for that. And I was like, all right, whatever. So DeAndre shows up. We set up her tent. And she has a pretty big tent. And I was like, man, who needs a tent like this? Well, eventually I buy a tent bigger than that. But we called her as the Taj Mahal. So we sent up this gigantic tent and she gets, she takes her two dogs out for a little walk. It's about like maybe 11 o'clock in the morning. She comes back and she goes, hey, Patrick, there is a waterfall trail back here. And I was like, what do you mean there's a waterfall trail? She says, there's a waterfall trail. I was like, I didn't know they had a waterfall out there. And she goes, you want to go do it? And I went, yeah, let's go do it. This would be fun. So she goes back into her tent to get 
harnesses for her dogs. I'm getting my coat on because I feel that this breeze kicking in and it starts to rain again. So here comes this drizzly rain. She steps out and she goes, is it raining? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she's like, no, I'm not going to walk. I, I, I'm not going to go for the walk. And I was like, why not? And she said, because the dogs are going to stink and I don't want to sleep in a, in a tent with two stinky dogs. I'm like, oh, so she closes up her tent. And she's done. I was like, all right, whatever. She goes, go see if mom wants to do it. And I already knew the answer to this question. I walked over and I got down and I looked in the tent and I said, Darla, do you want to go for a walk and go see a, a waterfall? And she's like, is it raining? And I went, yes. And she goes, no. <laughs> I was like, okay. She goes, see if Riley wants to go. And so I'm looking at Riley and he's looking at her. And I said, Riley, and he looks at me and I said, do you want to go for a walk? Do you want to go, you know, do a hike? And his ears perked up and he's, you know, you could tell, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants to go. So he runs over to me. I grab his harness and I have him trained enough that he'll lift up his two paws and I can bring his paws down to the openings of his harness. I get him all secured and off we go. And I said, I don't know how long this is going to be. And she's like, well, take your time. You know, it's all good. And we're, you're on a camping trip. Have fun. It's all right. I said, I'm leaving my phone here but I'm going to take my camera. And she said, okay. So I left the phone, put the camera in my pocket and off we went. So we, we walked down to the trees and stuff. And I asked DeAndre, where, where is this so-called trail? And she said, you go out to the road, you take a right and you just go down maybe 20, 30 feet and you'll see it's on the left. And I said, okay. So we walk over there and sure enough, here's this trailhead and it says waterfall trail. It's like, great. So we start walking on it. Of course, Riley's doing his business. You know, he's marking the territory. And we get to a, a point where it splits off. So one side says the waterfall trail, one hour, one like one point some miles, or the scenic side to the waterfall trail, and it's like one point five miles or something. I'm like, let's do the let's do this one. So we're we're gonna go on the, the scenic side. So you know, I got my camera, it's all set, and so we're walking up through and we're going around giant boulders and we're in the middle of the forest, and so you see these beautiful pines and lots of aspens and you can see rock outcroppings everywhere. And we're just kind of following along. Well, Riley starts to sniff certain areas and one of the spots that he gets to, he really becomes interested in this, in this one location. And when he pops his head back up, his ears tucked back, his tail tucks under, and he wants to run. And I'm like, what's your deal? And he looks terrified. So I reach down and pick him up. And I'm holding him where I got my right palm up against his chest and he's straddling my elbow. And I'm like, Riley, where is it? So his nose is going a mile a minute. His ears are twitchy. And he, he's looking. He's trying to figure out where this is at. I put my face next to his and I'm looking right down his line of sight. And I'm like, Riley, where, where is this? And, and I'm thinking we've got a mountain lion, a bear or a moose. One of those three is in this area, and I don't know which one it is. I know there's bear sightings in, you know, all over the, posted everywhere. Mountain lions are given. Moose are kind of random in this area. So I'm, so I'm holding them. I don't see a moose. I don't see a cat, and I don't see a bear, but I'm watching Riley, and he's now fixated on these trees about 75, 80 feet in front of us. And I was like, I don't see it, dude. I don't see it. And so after a while, I feel him relax. He turns. He gives me a kiss from my chin up to about my eye. I'm like, are we done? Okay. So I put him back down on the ground. He's all happy. And the mood in the area changes back to like, like the happy go lucky thing. It's still drizzly rain. So we're still walking. We repeat this whole process 20 consecutive times until we get to this area that I call a zigzag. So as you're walking up to this trail, there's a rock outcropping you're going to run into, but it, there's a hard right and eventually a hard left. And you're divided on the trail of where you can only go is following these rocks. So Riley runs up to the, the facing rock where the ground meets the rocks and he becomes steadfast. He wants to know what this is. He doesn't want to move. He is sniffing that spot. I'm looking at him. I'm switching the, the leash from my right hand to my left hand behind me. And I'm looking at him and I said, don't you run. <laughs> I'm tired of you running. So I turn and as I'm turning, there's a pine tree that I can see that's about seven to 12 feet in front of me and just a little bit off to the side. And when I look up, what I'm seeing sitting next to that pine tree 
to the best of my ability is a gorilla. And I was like, we don't have gorillas in Colorado. We've got gorillas in Colorado. No, there's no gorillas in Colorado. Oh my God, there's gorillas in Colorado. No way, this is cool. I mean, I was ecstatic. <laughs> I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And this guy is sitting down, right? So the lowest branch on this pine tree is about six and a half feet off the ground. I'm looking at this thing sitting underneath this pine tree. And it's got a pile of grass between its legs. His legs are spread. I can see his knees. I can see his, his legs are extended towards, technically towards me, but they're split because of this pile of grass. His feet are sitting upright and they're bent. They're bent funny, like in the middle. And his toes are wiggling. So he is clearly in his own little world. So what he's doing is he's ripping up grass. He's taking a bite out of the tips of the grass, lifting his arm above his head, releasing. And that's when I notice a thumb and four fingers. And I started thinking, okay, that's not a bear because a bear, I'd see the snout, I'd see the ears, and he would look drastically different. And he wouldn't have hands. He would have paws. So I was like, okay, so it's clearly a a gorilla. The pads on his feet or almost like uh, my hands, so like kind of a creamy red color. And I was like, okay, but since when do gorillas have human feet? That doesn't make any sense to me. That's weird. But on the reverse side, I can see black, and I can see black toenails. His hands are black, and both sides of his hands are black. He has got black fingernails. If you look at our finger, and you look at the size of their finger, if you, if you try to make a C, from your first finger to your thumb, and you leave about an inch between that space, that's how thick their fingers are. And I was like, this guy's big. (laughs) And then I started really thinking about his size because I stand five feet, 10 and three quarter inches tall. This guy sitting down, now we're on the same plane. He's not higher in elevation. We're on the same plane. We're exactly the same. Sitting down, he's easily six feet tall easily. <laughs> and I was like, okay, his, his shoulder width, yeah, four feet. I can see the four foot, the width of this. The arms, if I grouped up my legs and I added two more extra pairs of thighs on me, that would be the thickness on his arms as well as his legs. The thickest point on his thighs, the thickest point on his arms. I was like, oh my God, th- this is crazy. I've never seen a gorilla this size before. Never in my entire life have I seen a girl of this size before. I started noticing other things that uh, when he would lift his arms up above his head and release grass, he was tracking the grass as it fell to the ground and the grass is blowing around. So I already know he can't hear me because the rain that's coming down is like white noise to him. He, He can't hear that whatsoever. Why he's not smelling me is because the wind that's whipping around because of this drizzly rain is going from him to me. So he can't smell me. This is like the perfect storm for any researcher looking for a Sasquatch. And I'm sitting there going, okay, and he's preoccupied. This is perfect. But I start to notice his eyes and his eyes are glowing under the tree. And it's like someone took a mag flashlight, put it back behind his head and kicked it on because you can see this like cone of light that kind of comes out about 10 inches from his face. It extends out and then it fades off. When the sun was trying to break through the clouds, the eye that was facing, that was more out, which would have been his right eye, because his left eye would be closer to the tree, his right eye would fade back and where I could see whites in his eyes. And I was like, oh, that's crazy. So I'm seeing the glow effect happen in one eye and it's not happening in the other eye. But once it gets dark and uh, rainy again, that light effect, it comes back in. Like it's always there. People may only see part of the eye shine only when it's dark outside and not so much when it's light outside, like what I'm experiencing. So I'm really like engulfing myself in this. Riley is still behind me sniffing. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take a picture of this guy. (laughs) So I reach in my pocket pull out my camera. The camera that I'm using is called the Pentax WG-1. And it's a little purple point and shoot camera. I had it when I I went to Australia in April of that year. And the hat that I was wearing also came from Australia. It was actually made from kangaroo leather. 
So my hat is soaking up all the water that's hitting. I was hoping what was about to happen wasn't going to happen. But here I got this hat on and I can feel the kind of the wetness piercing through the leather on the hat, which is kind of strange. I get the camera ready and I'm kind of adjusting. I am kind of getting down a little bit to try to get the right shot because I can't really see him in the back screen of my camera. When I was scuba diving with my camera, it got scruffed up from the sand and stuff in, in the waters off the Great Barrier Reef. Anyway, so I, I was trying to get the shot of them. And I take a first shot, no flash. And I look at the camera. Oh, so I, t- <laughs> I take a second shot. It doesn't show up. Take a third shot. It doesn't show up. I was like, okay, let's do a flash. So I get the camera set up for a flash. I'm hoping to catch him with his arm above his head. And when the shot goes off, the flash happens. And I realize that he is, he's got his left arm and he's scratching his uh, right arm. And when the flash goes off, I look up at him and he moves his arms, his elbows to his knees. And now he kind of shifts his body just enough. He's now looking at me and I'm looking at him. And I have no choice but to get closer to him because the trailhead takes me to him. So Riley comes walking up. I take a couple steps forward. So I'm getting closer to him. He's not moving. He's still sitting there. And Riley turns and he he kind of goes down the trail and stops. And I said, hold on, Riley. So he Riley's just sitting there. If he's acknowledging the Sasquatch, he's not showing it. Riley's a small little 10 pound dog. He, he's, he's very uh, skittish for the most part, but he is not responding like he's paying attention to me and nothing else. So I'm looking at this guy sitting underneath the tree and I said, don't get up. And I reach over and I put my hand out, my right hand out, and I'm capturing water in my right hand. And he's paying attention to what I'm doing. I pull my hand back and I'm looking at the water. And I said, yeah, it's still raining, dude. And I pour the water out in front of him. And again, I said, don't get up. I went, <clears throat> I, I pretended to cough, pretended to sneeze. I said, I don't want to get sick. I don't want you getting sick. I turned and I said, me and my dog are going to go down the trail. You have a great day. And I gave him the peace signal. And I said, peace out. And I walked away from him. I'm thinking, you know, I, I've never seen a gorilla before, a big gorilla before. So <laughs> we go walking down the trail and I'm still looking at the picture going, that is crazy. That's so cool. I, I in a million years, I never thought I'd find a gorilla in Colorado. So I put the camera away in my pocket. I keep looking behind me, expecting to see I'm going to get ambushed. And there's nothing. I don't see him. I don't see him at the tree anymore. I don't. I just don't see him. So we keep walking down the trail. Well, we eventually get to a rock outcropping. Or there's one rock. It's not really a rock outcropping. It's like a boulder. The boulder is. It's got a sheared back. It's four feet wide. It's at least seven feet in height and it's tapered at the top. There's a bunch of baby aspens on the left side of the trail. And I can touch this rock from the trail. And there's a downed aspen that looks like a beaver had chewed through it and it dropped this aspen. It still had green and uh, yellow leaves on it because it was turning because it was fall. And all the grass behind this rock is all yellow. I can see the um, the castle part of the rock face to my right, and I can see like this boulder field type thing off to the right as well. So I was like, okay, I'm sitting there. And after about five minutes, I start to get creeped out. Like there is something on this rock. And the first thought that rolls through my head is a bear. And I, so I was like, oh, wait a second. How could a bear get on top of that rock? There is nothing behind that rock. And I would hear that bear scrambling to try to climb that thing. I don't see it. And plus, he would probably come around the the sides of the boulder and we're going to have a mauling situation and that would be terrible. And I'm not hearing him. He's not making any grunting sounds. I can't. So then I started thinking, well, the only other possibility, it's not going to be a moose. So it's got to be a cat. It's all, no, it's a mountain lion. Oh, God, that's going to be terrible. So, So I'm thinking that whatever it is on my right here is now a cat like a mountain lion. And what happens is I catch movement on my right side. I I see kind of a quick little movement and I feel a breeze go past my face. Now I'm thinking this big time, this is a cat. I'm like, oh my God, uh, mountain lion. So I'm looking at Riley. Okay, how do I get Riley into my coat and fight a mountain lion? This is going to be a terrible scenario. So I'm trying to figure out in my head how to do this. I'm really working it out. In the meantime, there's more movement that comes in towards my face this breeze goes past me again. And I'm like, what is this? Well, I start to pick apart that this is not a mountain lion. 
Because if it's a cat, again, it would be making sounds and it's not making sounds. It's not making like an attacking sound. There's nothing there. And if he's trying to paw at me, I am in striking distance. He could hit me. So if it's not a cat, is it a gorilla? (laughs) It's like, no, there's no way that that this can be that guy. And I had to dismiss that, but I couldn't dismiss it. I decided to kind of shift my eyes and look to the right and just kind of sit there and wait. And eventually I see what comes in and it pulls off was a face, a human looking face, like the gorilla that I just saw sitting underneath the tree back there. I was like, oh crap, (laughs) this isn't going to be right. So I'm like, all right, I've been a security guard for six and a half years. I can turn and look to my right. I know I can do this. And there's no reason for me to fear this. So I had to psych myself up and I was I was taking some deep breaths. In the meantime, there's movement, there's wind blowing past my face. I said, okay, okay, okay. I looked at right and I said, dude, you're on your own. (laughs) So I turned and I looked straight up this rock and my head went straight back. I was looking straight up. If a person extends their hand out as high as you can go and you turn your fingers back towards your, your head, that is the exact location of where this guy's head was. And within seconds, his head went from where it was at within 10 inches of my face. And he was looking from the right side to the left side of my forehead. And he would retract back. I was like, what are you doing? And the first few words that rolled out of my mouth were, holy schmoly. And that echoed all over the place because I yelled that as loud as I could yell. He just came in, he looked right at me, and we were making eye contact. He was looking left and right across my forehead. And I was like, what are you looking at? And I kept saying, what are you looking at? And eventually he would stop doing that and he would lock his eyes on my eyes. And he had this blank stare in his face. Now, his eyes have absolutely no veinage in his eyes whatsoever. I saw no veins, not even the tiniest inkling of a vein. I did not see it. They just looked opaque white. The coloring inside of his eyes were hazel like mine. So I was like, okay, that's cool. I'm not having issues with this. There was no hair on his face. Uh, His face was black in color. He had four stress lines above uh, his, where his eyebrows would be. I didn't even see eyebrow hair. It just looked like the guy had no facial hair whatsoever. But he had hair going all the way around the outside of his head. And that hair was really kind of crazy because around his neck was like this thick hair, kind of like like a chow chow would have going around its neck. And I raised two chows. So it really had this, this really beautiful, almost like a mane look to him. I can see his head, his the main area and part of his chest. I cannot see the rest of him because the rest of him is, is behind the boulder. And I don't see his arms or his hands because I'm thinking his hands are probably pressed up against that rock so he can bend over and support himself as he's bending over and looking at me from that boulder. I'm still staring at this guy, really getting into it. And I start to think about this little bit of training that I did when I was security. When I was in the hospital, I had to deal with people who were having a really bad day to break the tension with them and me and the staff. I would say, hey, dude, and I'd crack a smile. And that usually broke the tension, you know, all together with these folks. So here I am looking at this guy. He's got a blank stare on his face. There's no facial expressions. And I yell, hey, dude, and I cracked a smile. Well, he looks at me and then he looks down at my smile. Within 10 seconds, he cracks a smile that is three times longer than mine. And he has this new look on his face. It just totally shut down everything for me because I love this guy now. (laughs) I think he's the coolest thing on the planet. And I'm smiling and I'm still talking to him. I can hear him breathing, but I can't hear. He's not, there's no vocal nothings. He's not verbally saying one ounce to me. He's just leaning in, looking left and right and pulling back. Now the sun has come out. My jacket is somewhat open and my hat, because it's made out of leather, is beginning to squeeze my head. And I think that's what he was looking at because my head hurt right at that scene. And I started to think that maybe he thought that the leather trim work was maybe the leather or like my skin 
that had been stretched out because there was a good fine mark that was being created on my head at that moment in time. So when I went back and I was talking to Jim, he told me a story. And when I was back at the, the store, he had told me the story about these two dads and these two little boys. And I was thinking about this while this was all going on. They were in the same rough area and the two fathers got ahead of the kids a little bit and they split off and they went off into these boulders. They were kind of hiding back in the rocks. The kids came walking up and they're like, yeah, dad. And one of them said, oh, I think dad probably went back to, they went back to camp. So the one father picks up a stick and he does a wood dog. So the kids are like, oh, wood dog, wood dog. Oh, quick, dad, dad, there's this big foot, there's a big foot. Picks up a stick and he does a wood knock back. So they're doing these wood knocks. The other father picks up a couple of rocks, does some rock clacking. And the little boy goes, oh, rock, 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 like, rock, like, you know, got to do some rocks. So he's like rock clacking back. And this is going on. Well, the father who's, who's doing the, the wood knocking looks at his buddy. And he thinks this is just the funniest thing in the world. Just so happens to notice that there's something moving up in the boulders above them. And he looks up and he sees this big, hairy thing looking down at his kids. And he's like, what is that? So he's looking up at it. The other guy who's doing the rock clacks looks at his buddy and he knows his buddy is looking up into the mountains or looking up into the rocks. So he looks up. They're both looking at the same thing. And so the one father who had the stick drops his stick and the, the other guy drops his rocks while the kids are still doing the rock clacks and the wood knocking. The one father yells, hey, bear. And instead of just saying, if this was a bear, bears usually would drop down on all fours and either they walk away or they, they kind of pivot right and left and they kind of pay attention. They may come down, you know, you never know what a bear is going to do. So this thing, instead of doing any of that, it starts to crouch behind the rocks, you know, behind the boulders, and he's going down slowly. And that freaks out both fathers. They run out of, from where their hiding spot was, grabbed the kids, and they said, we saw a bear. And they went out and they reported this with a BFRO. So here I am <laughs> looking up at this thing and it kind of clicks into my head. I'm going to say, hey, bear. Clearly, this is not a bear, but I am looking straight up at him and I yell, hey, bear. And again, my voice echoes off the rock face and everything. And it's like he just kind of looked at me funny. He still has a smile. He's still looking down at me. And I got the sensation like, you think I'm a bear? Let me show you. And he starts to write himself to where he is fully extended up. And I'm just looking straight up at this guy going, oh, oh, my, are you big? Wow, are you big? <laughs> and I'm just looking straight up at him. And he is clearly two times my height. And I was like, oh, man, he's, he's got to be at least, what, 10, 12 feet tall? Oh, man. <laughs> And I'm just looking straight up at this, this guy and he's just looking down at me. And at that moment, he starts to like crouch, like he, he wants to crouch down. He, he wants to go behind the boulder and he starts to lowering himself down. Well, it gets to a certain point where he can't. And I start watching him and he is, his shoulders are pitching to the right and pitching to the left and he's going down. So he must be adjusting himself until he can get all the way down to the ground, get situated. So as he's going down, I'm like, what are you doing? And eventually his head disappears behind the rock. And I'm like, okay, did this just happen? Was I just seeing things? Well, Riley gets done and he walks over and he turns around like, come on, let's go. I'm like, no, hold on here a second. I'm not leaving it. I'm still trying to figure out if I just saw all of this. I decide what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a half step back. So I'm going back between the, the rock and the tree, the downed aspen. I take this half step and I look, if you could draw a line between your eye and your ear and you start at the top of your head and go all the way down the body, you're going to see this guy. So I see all that. I see everything from the, I don't see the eye, but I see the, the head. I see the hair. I see the ear tip. I see the shoulder. I see the part of the arm. I see the legs. The knee is, is about the height of my chest. I can see the ankle. He's, I can see his foot. I can see all of his toes. And I'm like, oh, he is real. And at that moment, he leans out and he's looking at me and he's still smiling. He goes back behind the rock and he comes back out again. And I said, dude, are you playing peekaboo? And he goes back behind the rock, comes back out again. Again, he, I'm, I'm looking at this guy and he stops. 
And like, you are playing peekaboo. And I'm trying to decide now what I'm about to do because I w- really want to walk around this rock. You have no idea how bad they want to do it. Riley's looking at me. He, he's, he's ready to go for, to finish off this walk. And I started to think, why is Riley with me? Why didn't I take him back to his mom in the very beginning? Because if he wasn't here, I was about to walk around that rock. I guess the end result would have been maybe drastically different than what I experienced prior to this. But I decide I'm not going to do that. I decide I'm going to take Riley back. One of the things I, I don't remember if I actually, if I described his face, but when you look at this guy's face, the width of his head, if you put your hands to your face and you, ex- and you go out four to five inches on either side of your face and you touch your fingertips and then you try to go down and you touch the palms together, that is the size of his face. If you go four to five inches more out from that and you do that same exact thing, that's the size of his head with hair. This guy's a big individual. I didn't feel threatened by him. I didn't feel like I was going to die from him. It was like a wake-up call, like being greeted by somebody that maybe you've known a long time in your life, but you've never met them until now. This was just one of those sensations. So I look at Riley, I look at him, and I said, dude, I'm going to take the dog back to our campsite. And I gestured, I put my hands together, put it up next to my face, and I pointed in the direction where our campsite is. And I said, I want to see you again. So I pointed to myself, I pointed to my eyes, and I pointed to him, meaning I wanted to see him again. I eventually said, stay safe, dude, I'm going to go. So I ended up leaving and I walked away. We ended up going to where the waterfall was, where the so-called waterfall was. I looked back after like about 15, 20 feet, and he's not there. He's no longer behind that rock. I'm like, okay, where'd he go? I'm looking for this tall guy and I don't see him. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I ended up walking out and I come across a dad and two kids. They asked me what was down this trail. And I said, you know, I thought I saw something down there, but I'm not sure. I didn't want to tell them what I saw because who knows, you know, how this thing is going to react around two children and an adult. So I just dismissed it. I said, I thought I saw something moving, but I wasn't sure. Okay, that's great. And so they went off on that trail. I said, by the way, what's up that hill? And they said, well, you can get all the way up to the top of the castle if you follow this trail up. I was like, oh, that's cool. And he goes, but don't take your dog because it's too dangerous. I said, okay. And I said, what's down the, the, the opposite direction? And he goes, there's a parking lot. I said, there's a parking lot here? And he goes, yeah, there's to the left of that is a Boy Scout camp that's dedicated to the Boy Scouts. I'm like, really? Oh, man. And he goes, man, you need to go and explore this park more. I was like, apparently I got to do that. So I start going down these stairs and these stairs are weird. Whoever made these stairs in this park really made them for something else because when you step down or step up them, it's about a two foot high step. So each step you're going up almost two feet to the next step. I was like, who designed stairs like this? It's, this is uncomfortable for a person. So I end up walking all the way out. I get to the, the open area and we end up walking all the way back to the our campsite. We finally get back and Darla looks at me and DeAndre looks at me. Oh, here they are. Sure. Now you show up. I'm like, what are you talking about? In my mindset, I've been gone for two hours. The reality is I wasn't gone for two hours. A few years later, um, I was talking to my friend, Brian Hammond, who passed away last year. And he was curious about my first experience. And so I was telling him about, about it. And Darla was like with an earshot. And I said, yeah, I was only gone for like two hours. And she said, when? And I said, when I had Riley and I saw a Sasquatch in, or the gorilla or Sasquatch up in Bailey. And she goes, no, you weren't gone for two hours. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, no, you were gone for six. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, you left at noon and you came back at 6 p.m. I did. And she goes, yeah, didn't you know that? And I said, no, I left my cell phone in, in the tent. I had no way of knowing what time it was. And she said, yeah, you were gone for six hours. So I started adding this up while talking to Brian. I said, Brian, that puts me hanging out with a Sasquatch for five and a half hours on the trail in Bailey, Colorado. And he's like, oh my gosh. And I said, yeah, that was crazy. The very next day, back to the the event, I told Dolly, you know, I'm going to go hike up the top of this mountain. I wanted to see what's up there. And she goes, when are you going to take Riley? I went, no, it's too dangerous. I'm going to leave him here. And she said, okay. So I grabbed my camera again. I said, I'm leaving my phone. (laughs) So I go out and I start walking down the dirt road. Now, 
there's campers all over the place now. There's there's big RVs and all kinds of stuff. And as I'm walking out, there's this berm that goes about six, seven feet, eight feet up from where I'm at. And there's a camper up there. I can see it. So as I'm walking down this dirt path, I start to hear a second set of footsteps happening. And I stop and I catch it taking a half step. So I know it's not me doing it. It's not an echo. I'm like, well, what the heck? Who is up there? So I keep saying, hey, you know, if you want to come down, come on down. I was hoping to see somebody step over and go, oh, are you talking to me? But that didn't happen. There was nobody up there. Everybody was asleep. And I was like, okay. So I'm taking pictures here and there of the sunrise coming up, a beautiful sunrise against the lake. Just keep walking. And I would stop just to see. And again, I hear this half step or a, step, a full step. I'm like, why aren't you just coming down? I don't understand why whatever this is, is not coming down to hang out with me. It just doesn't want to do it, but it wants to pace me. I was like, okay, whatever. So I keep walking. About that time, I noticed there's these two crows and these two crows are hanging out and they're like flying from tree to tree and they stop and they turn and look at me. They're, burp, 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 burp. they're making all these calls at me. I'm like, what are you guys doing? You know, so I'm talking now to the birds and I'm trying to see if whatever this is, is going to come out. Now, I didn't know that there was a connection between Sasquatch and crows. I do now, but I didn't know then. So I was like, okay, whatever. So I, I keep walking around. And eventually I get to this open area and I was like, you two birds aren't going to follow me over this way. And they just sat there and they turned and they looked back at something next to a camper. And I was looking at the camper. I didn't see it. I was like, well, dude, you're going to have to walk all the way around those campers to get to where I'm at. I started heading back towards the forest. It's probably a good 50 to 80 yards from where I'm standing to where the forest starts. So I start walking back there and there's, I noticed that there's another trail that goes off to my left and there's a tent that's over next to the lake. As I'm looking down this trail, there's another forest back there. It's like an extension of that park. So it's like a secondary park. So as I'm walking past that, to my left, I hear three consecutives, whoop, whoop, whoop. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so I look that way. And those calls came from up in the trees over there. And I'm like, what is this, an eight pavilion? And it was really kind of bizarre. So I kept walking. And right when I get into the forest, there's a big giant. This boulder is like 25, 30 feet in height and in diameter. This thing is ginormous. And I was like, wow, that's a big boulder. So I'm walking in under the branches and stuff. And it's kind of muddy because it was, you know, all the rain that we had the prior week. And I'm trying to avoid all the, the muddy steps. And this scream happened, or this, this response goes, whoop, really loud. <laughs> that shot me back, like, into a mud puddle. And I was like, what are you doing? Don't do that. You know, you literally scared me to death. Don't do that again. And I can hear it moving around like it's milling around on top of that boulder. I'm like, how did you get up there? That's crazy. I just keep walking. And so I eventually get to those steps and I'm really getting a good burn workout climbing those stairs. And eventually I get onto the trail and it says, you know, stay on the trail. Well, the trail markers are terrible and I, and I couldn't find the trail when I was going up it. So I was screwing up boulders, trying not to slide off the boulders and meet my untimely death. So I kept climbing, 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 climbing. And I get to a spot where it's kind of flat. There's a rock outcropping that's to my left or behind me. And at first I didn't see what I was, what I thought I was going to see. And I'm kind of looking down. I'm looking out into this valley to my right. I look up and I, what I see looks like a hairy person with its arms crossed holding onto a dead tree. Like it's holding onto a branch and it's standing out on this dead tree. And the dead tree is still upright. So it's standing there. And I'm like, what? And so I'm looking out, trying to figure out what it's looking at. And then I, I heard uh, a Beach Boys song coming up from down in the valley. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. So you're hearing the music. And across from the park is a gun range. When you're up in the mountains, you can hear that gun range going off. You can hear them firing the guns. And I'm like, oh, what a depressing day to listen to that. And, and I look back and I said, man, I wish you'd just turn. And it was like on cue. Right when I said that, this individual drops an arm down and it turns and looks. And as it's doing that, I can see roughly the face. And this is a female and she is smiling and she's looking my direction. And I was like, no way. This can't be right. 
So I'm looking at her and I said, yeah, you're not a male. And there's reasons why. And I, I'm not going to say the reasons why, but she brings up her arm. She brings it up to her chest and she's still standing there. And I thought, man, I, I need to get some pictures of this. So I pull out my camera and I take four or five consecutive photographs of this thing at di- different lengths, different, like from where it should be versus me zooming in on it and taking a full on shot. I said, okay, now I want to get on that side of the ravine. I want to get over there. But from where I'm at, I can't do that. It's like a, easily a 50 to 60 foot drop. But I can see land down there. I just don't know how to get down to that spot. So I decide what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep going up and eventually I'm going to find somebody. And I do. And I find all these people they are coming down off the mountains. And I even I was greeted by a dog coming off the mountains, which I thought was kind of odd. I thought dogs weren't allowed up there. But I talked to this one guy. I said, how do you get up to the other side? And he said, we well, got to go up to the boulders and you got to jump from boulder to boulder to boulder until you get over to the other side. And I'm thinking, oh, that's going to be great. So I was like, okay. So I started going up there, but he goes, I wouldn't do it right now. I'd get off the mountain. I was like, why? And he goes, you'll see. I said, what do you mean? And he said, just, you'll see when you get up there. He didn't tell me anything. So I went all the way up to the top of this mountain. I can still see part of the rock face of the, of the castle. And this guy, and I see these two repellers coming off the side of this mountain. And they're like, hurry up, man, hurry up. And they're coming down. And I'm like, what are they freaking out about? Again, I'm thinking mountain lion or bear is up there. And these guys were running past me and go, and they said, dude, you got to get off the mountain. And I was like, why? And he said, just look, go over to the left here and look behind the mountain. And I said, okay, beautiful views back there, by the way. So I go walking back and I'm looking back there and I see this black as night thunderhead. It's moving. I want to say it's moving south to north. And as it comes in, it stops. And I'm like, what? And I'm staring at this thing going, I've only seen one other Thunderhead do this, and it was when I got married. And so I was like, that wasn't a good sign. And this thing just starts coming my direction. And the rest of the sky is beautiful blue. So I'm like, oh, man. So I quickly run back over. I look down into the valley where this girl was, and I don't see her on the log no more. I'm like, oh, this ain't right. So I start running to where I climbed up from. And now I can see where the trailhead is. And then clearly I was not anywhere near the trails. So I started running down this trail as fast as I could to get off this mountain. And I was sliding all over the place. So the cloud gets closer and closer and I can hear lightning or I can hear the thunder, see the flashes of the lightning. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. I'm going to die on this mountain. <laughs> so I'm, I'm screwing down as fast as I can. I'm the last person off this mountain. And I am literally hauling as fast as I can. I get up to where where I saw her and I took my camera and I took a side or a quick photograph because it looked like I saw something running between two rocks and it was moving. Like I could see that the form of say what a Sasquatch does with the arms extended. And I took a couple photographs and I quickly shot off from that point, kept going down as fast as I could. Once I got to the bottom, the cloud had already passed over me and it was going over to where the, like roughly where the, um, gun range was and there was all kinds of lightning going on and people were hunkering down because they thought it was just going to be a nasty storm but it just blew on over so i turn with my camera and i take a a landscape shot of that area when i was coming down just like when i was going up i noticed that there was a lot of caves and i was taking random photographs here and there going up and down that mountain i was hoping that i had a lot of those photographs of caves and stuff because i was really interested if what I saw really was a Sasquatch on either day, maybe the caves have something to do with it. And I've done caving before. I've been down 260 feet in the earth before. I know what to look for. I'm not worried about going into caves. I am worried about coming across a wild animal in a cave. I'm not so much worried about coming across a Sasquatch in a cave, but other people are worried for me because they know I am about to go into one of these caves eventually in the near future. So, I start walking back and, you know, I'm all excited again because I got these, these photographs. And so I come back and I'm showing the pictures to my girlfriend and to her daughter. And they're like, well, that could be something. I just don't know what that is. And I said, I'm going to go back in the Bailey. I want to show this to Jim. And she's like, okay, if that's what you want to do, I leave Riley there. I jump in the car. I drive all the way back to Bailey. I get out and I go up to the business and I think her name is Daphne. I think his wife's name is Daphne. And I walk in and go, Daphne, is this 
is Jim here? And she goes, no. I said, let me show you a picture of Sasquatch. And so I showed her the first picture. She goes, I don't see it. And Darla didn't see it either. The picture doesn't really do a whole lot of justice for this. But the second photograph of this individual holding onto this log does. And she was like ecstatic. She was like, this is cool. This is what a Bigfoot looks like. Oh my God. She was excited. She goes, I thought my husband was nuts. <laughs> he wanted to do all these crazy things. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, you know, I thought there was a lot of craziness to it too, but I wasn't sure if I actually photographed really what I saw. This was always on my mind if this was a legit photograph or maybe I was seeing something and my mind just put other things in place, but I did see an arm drop. I did see a turn and look. And I, I was like, okay, so those parts were there. Okay, so I eventually got back and I said, yeah, she was excited. Jim wasn't there, so he hasn't seen these photographs. So on Sunday, we do our dinner and everything. Her grandson or um, DeAndre's son, JC, and his dad are coming out Sunday to spend a couple of days out there. So DeAndre's going to stay. We're going to leave on Sunday. So Saturday night, we do our thing. We all go to bed. I'm so hyped up on this. I'm laying there, Darla's asleep, Riley's in his little nest, and I'm sitting there thinking about all the things I've, that I had experienced so far. Off in the distance, I hear what sounds like heavy footfalls. And these are... And I'm sitting there going, what is that? And I could kind of feel it. You know, it was really kind of odd. But it didn't make sense because where this sound was coming from it really sounded like it was way back near the rock face. And that would be about maybe 150, maybe 200 yards from where we're at. So that wouldn't make sense that I could feel it, but I could hear it. And everything was quiet. There wasn't any sounds going on in the forest. And you could hear this thing coming. And eventually it turns and it starts walking our direction. I'm just laying there going, huh. I kind of feel like Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, where he's sitting there in the Jeep and he's got a broken leg and he's looking down at the T-Rex footprint. And every time the T-Rex took a step, you'd see that ripple effect. And he goes, you know what that is? That's an impact tremor. You know, he says, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. That's when the T-Rex comes blowing through the, the forest and these guys take off in the Jeep. Well, I'm sitting there thinking, I wish I had a glass of water <laughs> because I want to put that on the ground to see if I would see an impact tremor. Because the sensation I'm getting is I can feel this. So it eventually comes to the dirt road and it's crossing the dirt road. Now, Riley is now up and he's looking to the back of the tent and I'm kind of leaning his direction. So I get up, Darla's still asleep. And as it walks into the trees, like leading to us, every step is greeted with a tree break. So you hear the step and you hear... A step, step, that is the creepiest sound on the planet. If there was nobody else around, I would be worried. <laughs> and this thing was coming in and breaking off a branch as it came. Each step, right step, right side break, left step, left side break. And it just came all the way down until it got to our tent. And I was like, oh my gosh, by this time, Riley's head is now facing vertical he's looking straight up and i'm like riley where is he <laughs> knowing where he's at i already know where he was riley's eyes looked at me and looked up looked at me looked up and like hello dad he's up here he's up here. he's right here he's right above us i'm looking at riley i'm actually cracking up and the same turns it takes like a step and a half to get to my hammock once it hits my hammock i hear the hammock get pushed i hear the kink and i get a little bit of a, a chain sound I'm like, what are you doing to my hammock? Whoever it is grabs my hammock and he pulls it to the left. Ching! Pulls it to the right. Ching! And I'm like, what the heck? What are you doing? And then it's left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And I was like, what are you doing, dude? Then he picks it all the way up and he extends the hammock to the, as high as it can possibly go. So it's like, ching! And you can hear it the vibrating part on the chain, just enough. And I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And it brings it down. 
And he brings back up. He's always going up, down, up, down, side to the side, side to the side, side to the side, up, down, up, down. And I finally said, knock it off. You're going to break it. And he released it. And it just went ching, ching, ching. Just kind of stopped. And he took a half step, turned around, took a step and a half to get to me. He stops right there. And I know that he wants me out of my tent. I know he wants me out. And I, and I want to go out. But again, now I've got this dog in the tent that if I unzip that tent, he's going to move. And I reached for the zipper to try to zip just to see what he'd do. And Riley, man, he was ready to go. And I was like, no, nope, we're not doing that. So I moved Riley back. I said, okay, we're, we're not going to leave. We're just staying right here, Riley. So I'm turning around and I'm to, to say something to him. About this time, Dexter and Angie start to bark. And they are barking and they're growling snarling barking this goes on for about a good 30 to 40 seconds out of nowhere both dogs start going and it stops it's like silence for a split second i thought the dogs got out and they just died but deandre speaks up and says what are you barking at What's wrong with you two? And why are you crying? I didn't hit you. Shut up. Go to sleep. And so she gets back into her, her sleeping bag and her window is open. She can see out of her window, but she's not looking up. She's curled up and she's feeling like there's something there, but she's not willing to look out that window. In the meantime, Riley barks. So Riley takes off. Bar, 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 bar. And I'm like, what are you doing? I said, shut up, Riley. He's like, bar, 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 bar. and he does the same thing. He starts crying. He turns and he comes up between my right arm and my right side. And he burrows in tight, super tight against my body. And I just look up and said, you need to stop. He's not going to hurt you. Just quit. And at that moment, I feel Riley relax. And I was like, okay. This is weird. I don't know what this is. So I'm like, okay. You know, so I'm petting Riley. I said, dude, I want to see you, but I can't, clearly. So he turns out and he starts to walk away. You can hear all the steps going out. And I'm like, okay, okay. Well, Darla wakes up at that moment and she said, why is Riley barking? What's going on? <laughs> I was like, don't worry about it. It's all good. I got it taken care of. He's fine. Don't worry about it. She goes, well, if he's going to act up like that, just get out of the tent. And I was thinking, you don't know how bad I want to do that. <laughs> but at the same time, I can't let Riley out. I'm not going to do that. So I ended up putting Riley back down. He eventually curled up into his nest. I threw a cover over him. And I just sat there thinking, man, I want to see this guy. Again. I really want to come back. and I want to see this guy. The very next morning, I finally wake up. I hear dogs running around. I'm like, oh, no. You know, I'm thinking, I'm not going to see the footprints. I unzip the tent. Riley runs out. I put him on his cable. So he's running around. I'm looking around and DeAndre is giving me like this evil eye. And I zip up the tent because Darla's still kind of asleep. DeAndre looks at me and I said, what? And she goes, were you looking in my tent last night? And I was like, no. And she goes, are you sure? I went, yes. I said, I was in the tent with Riley. And I said, why? And she goes, I would have sworn you were peeking in my tent. And I said, why would I peek in your tent? And she's like, I don't know, to scare me, something, I, I don't know. I had the sensation that there was either one or two people looking into my tent. I said, no. I said, now, was this about the time when the dogs were barking? And she said, yes. I said, we had a visitor come into the campsite. And she said, are you sure? And I said, oh, yeah. Riley sounded off. Your dog sounded off. They went through that crying thing. Riley went through that crying thing. I don't know how something that can't see the dogs can make the dogs go quiet. You know, after barking and carrying on, I don't know what they're doing. I don't understand this. She was like, okay, so you think that uh, Bigfoot came into the campsite? And I said, yeah. And she, Darla woke up at that moment and said, there was no Bigfoot out there. You don't have no idea. I said, Darla, you weren't even awake. You woke up after the fact, after Riley was barking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, you don't have anything to say here. But yeah, there was something that came into the campsite. So I, I was walking around. The dogs have destroyed all known evidence on the ground. So you can't see anything. No footprints, no nothing. So I started walking back into the trees because I remember the tree breaks. And I look up into the trees and all the way down through at about 10 foot in height, 10 to 15 feet in height, there was a broken branch. They were broken all the way down. So these are all fresh breaks all the way down, all the way down on both sides. And I was like, now that's cool. And DeAndre said, what? And I said, all these branches were here before. They're not here now. And all those are broken. And she's like, how would you explain that? And she goes, I don't know. 
I said, we had a visitor come in. I heard him come in, take a step, and he was snapping branches, you know, all the way down through. Those are all the branches. And she goes, well, where are the branches now? I said, I don't know. I started walking back. She went back to camp. I got to the road and I could see where branches were used to scrape the ground to hide footprints. I'm like, that's pretty smart. That's really kind of cool. So when I finally got back into Denver, uh, because we left on Sunday, I didn't look at any of my photographs, not, not right off, but I started showing my pictures to a friend of mine, Ron, and I let him listen to the sounds. And he said, well, that sound sounds like a fox, the recording that I had. I said, well, that's interesting. And he goes, yeah, but, you know, I'm, I'm guessing. I said, well, I used to work over at or volunteer at the aquarium in Denver. I, you know, I'll just go down there and talk to them. He said, okay. And he said, do you know about the Bigfoot store? I said, what Bigfoot store? The one in Bailey? And he goes, no, no, no. There's a Bigfoot store on Colorado Boulevard. And I was like, oh. He tells me where it's at. I drive down there and I meet Mike Johnson from SUR. And SUR stands for Sasquatch Investigation of the Rockies. So Mike and I, we start up a rapport and we become pretty good friends. And I'm buying stuff from his store off and on. And I'm talking to him and Scott Bard, who was kind of living in, at the store. I got to know Scott pretty well. And Mike's a nice guy. Scott's a nice guy. And eventually I get asked to be part of Sir. But prior to that, I took my recording down to the aquarium in Denver. And I went in and I talked to the guys in the mammal department. And I said, hey, do you guys know what the sound is? And I played it for them. They said, oh, that, that's a fox. I said, okay, well, I heard that too. How long does a fox make that noise? And they said, five minutes. I said, just five minutes? He said, yeah, five minutes flat. I said, what happens after five minutes? He said, well, that call is to call in the mate to come in to take whatever food that they found and go feed the pups, right? But if you go longer with that, predators will come in and they will go after that fox and they'll try to eat the fox and the mate and the pups. I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, but we got a problem. And he said, what's that? I said, I recorded 45 minutes of a two-hour event. And they all looked at each other. And they said, well, then it's not a fox. And I said, well, if it's not a fox, what else could it be? They said, nothing. I said, are you saying that I found a new animal in Colorado? And they're like, "Mm, we're not saying that, but it has to be a fox. And I said, well, if it's a fox, then they make the calls longer. But the other equation is, would a fox leave the area that it's at come out of elevation and run through a campsite only to run like a mile or two and then go up into elevation and disappear in the mountains. And they said, absolutely not. So I said, do we know anybody over at um, Denver Zoo? And he said, yes. So they contacted the zoo. They were talking to us on speakerphone. I played the recording for them and they said, it's a fox. And they said, okay, so here's the problem. He's got 45 minutes total recorded of an event. And I said, no, it was a two hour event or I recorded 45 minutes of it. These guys were dumbfounded. They're like, well, there's nothing in the woods that can make that sound outside of a fox. I said, is there anything in the woods that can mimic a fox? And they said, no, there's, there's nothing in the woods in Colorado that can mimic a fox. That's not true. I already know that that's not true. But at the time I believed everything they were saying, but nobody knew what this recording was. So here I am working over at Swedish Medical Center. I've got Finding Bigfoot on TV, kind of break up the tension. Cliff Brockman comes on and he's doing a call. And it is identical to what I recorded in Colorado of that vocal. So I was like, wait a second. Cliff Brockman just got on there and he he openly stated, this is what Sasquatch sounds like. So I was like, okay, Jim got it wrong. All these people got it wrong. Yet Cliff Brockman does this vocal. That sounds just like what I recorded. So those were some of the Sasquatch stories that I have. And I will be back at some point to share more. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone loves in the bow. And the five string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music 
Sweet tea, kind of sounds. 